uh, for, for, that, uh, for that song. Okay, so good morning once again, everyone. We are continuing in our study of 1 Corinthians. We're getting near the end. We're going to end up everything, wrap it all up next week, uh, the week before I have my surgery, and then for the next following two weeks, we're going to have special speakers sharing with us about, about um, whatever the Lord lays on their hearts. But today we are going to look at the remainder, starting with verse 20, of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So the portion of the letter of 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, that we are going to be studying today is of the utmost importance for us as followers of Jesus Christ. The truth that Paul outlines in this passage is really what sets Christianity apart from all other religions. Paul makes it clear, he makes the clear and definitive argument in the first four verses of the chapter that we looked at last week, that if Christ has not been risen from the dead, then we are in a hopeless position and that we remain lost in our sins. The reason we have hope for eternal life rests in the fact that Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead. In the first four verses, of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul identifies the gospel message, the good news that he preached, the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And because our Savior died and three days later rose from the grave, we have the hope of forgiveness of sins and eternal life. Paul then goes on to provide the historical evidence for the resurrection by citing the eyewitnesses to the risen Christ. Peter, and then the apostles, and then 500 of his followers, and finally all saw, saw Jesus Christ alive. Then in verses 12 through 19, Paul explains the importance of the resurrection being a reality. Why is it important that he did, in fact, truly rise from the dead? He makes it very clear that without the resurrection, we would continue to be in our sin. That if we trust, however, in Christ only for this life, if it's only for this life that we are looking to Jesus Christ, we are pathetic. It's, we're just believing a lie. So he makes the, the, the argument very, very strong. And the bluntness and the frankness with which Paul faces this topic, really, I find it refreshing. He's not beating around the bush. He's not, you know, not, not, not uh, diminishing what it means that if Christ did not rise, we are pathetic. We are believing a lie. We have no hope. It would be ridiculous. He doesn't beat around the bush. He recognizes that without the historical reality of the resurrection of Christ, that our faith is in vain, and there is no reason that we should invest all of the energy into something that we do if it is only temporal and passing. Paul then ends with the statement that if Christ is not risen, we are among all people the most to be pitied. Then our discussion today, however, begins in verse 20 in which Paul clearly states that Christ is risen, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's true, Christ has been risen. If he hadn't, we would be pitiful, we would be miserable, we would be believing a lie, we would be fools, we would be just idiots. But that's not the case. But now Christ is risen. That's the truth. And that certainly it would be an awful situation if he weren't, but the fact is that he is, and we have a purpose for which to live. Paul go, goes on then in this chapter, in the next 38 verses, to provide more information than anywhere else in any other single portion of Scripture about the nature of our resurrection, the bodies we will have, and end times events. The challenge with studying these verses is to get as much information as we can from them, yet without trying to read too much into the text so that we try to draw conclusions that are not really legitimate. There are some amazing statements that Paul makes in this passage, 
And there is a temptation, however, to try to make it say more than it really does and try to infer conclusions that we cannot really make. However, there is still a great deal that we can know without a doubt about our future and what we can look forward to. Now, as human beings, we have a natural curiosity about eternity, about the nature of heaven and what we will be like and what our resurrection bodies are going to be like. And as we see in verse 35, these were questions that were asked by people 2,000 years ago. People have been asking that, what's it going to be like? What is it like on the other side? What is eternity going to be like? What are our bodies going to be like? They have been asking that question throughout time. And that curiosity has not gone away one single bit. It's normal for us to ponder what God has in store for us. But we also need to know that he has only revealed so much information and we should avoid the temptation to try to claim to understand more than what God wants us to know. So he's given us a lot here, a lot that we can mull over, that we can study, that we can examine, but we shouldn't try to go beyond what he has given us. So let's see what it is. What has God told us about the end times, about our resurrection, about eternity. We'll see what he has to say here. So here in verses 21 and 22, Paul reminds us that sin entered into the world through the disobedience of the first human beings and that the curse which came upon Adam and Eve was passed on to all, all of his offspring. It is a concept that Paul repeats as well in Romans, where he says this, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all have sinned. And then in verse 15 of Romans chapter 5, he goes on, But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more by the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And then in verse 18, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Now, in this passage, Paul is not saying that everyone is going to receive eternal life because of Jesus Christ. There's a contingency here that they must believe and trust in Christ in the gospel message that he died, was buried, and rose again. And then and only then will this gift of eternal life be made available. Perhaps a clearer way to read 1 Corinthians 15, 22 would be to say, for as in Adam all die, even so all in Christ shall be made alive. Then in verses 23 through 28, Paul gives a brief synopsis of the end times. Now, this is not a complete picture of everything that's going to happen uh, at, at the end of, uh, of time. But we have an idea here of what to expect as God accomplishes his plan for mankind. And although at this point in the passage, a little bit later, but at this point, he is not yet touching on a very important part of the scenario. So here it says, but each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end, and he delivers the kingdom to God the Father when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. For he has put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under his feet, it is evident that he who put all things under him is accepted. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subject to him who put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now on the screen behind me, there's a slide that I've used a number of times when discussing the end times events, which shows the basic scheme that is outlined in the Old Testament, in the Gospels, in the book of Revelation, and then the added truth that we see from the writings of the Apostle Paul. This is a very simple, basic uh, outline that you see here. Now, the scriptures 
actually describe three separate resurrection events in which believers will be raised. Paul, in this passage, is just kind of lumping all of these resurrections together to simply emphasize that Christ's resurrection must come first as what he describes as the first fruits, which makes it possible then, because of Christ's resurrection, the other resurrections of the believers can, can follow after that. He doesn't dis distinguish in this passage the different resurrections that we can see in other portions of Scripture. He's just kind of lump, link, uh, lumps it all together. So what he's talking about here is, it says after, after the, the, the resurrection, it says after which Christ is going to um, give up the kingdom and turn all things over to God the Father. This is speaking of the final consummation of all things after the 1,000 year reign. And then all things are placed directly under the authority of God the Father. And all the saved will be in the presence of God for eternity. Now there's a lot of details to discuss about that. In other words, where will the body of Christ be? Where will the people of Israel be? read what, or we heard the song that Larry was singing, you know, we're not waiting for Jerusalem. So there's a lot more detail to talk about those things. But the basic scheme that Paul gives here in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28, is that ultimately everything, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, all believers can be resurrected, given new life, and then God is going to, we will be with God throughout eternity, and he is going to bring everything under his, under his rule. That's the basic outline that he gives here. Again, what you see on the back here is a, is a general outline of the end times. And of course, what we are waiting for is this red arrow. We'll be looking at this a little bit later. That's the rapture of the church, the catching away. Paul states that the last enemy to be defeated will be death. And this is accomplished through the resurrection. In Revelation 20, 14, it says, talking about the end times, it says, then death and Hades are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So when this takes place, death will be abolished. And the redemptive process that God promised from the moment of the fall will be completed with the casting away of death into the lake of fire. The redemption process will be finished at that point. The point of all this is to assure us as believers, as I said, the, this passage here in 1 Corinthians 15, 23 through 28 is not to give us a detailed outline. This is more to give us hope and assurance. The purpose of this is to assure us that as believers, the greatest fear of mankind, the fear of death, will no longer be something that those of us in Christ need to be worried about. There is a time that will come when our physical bodies will be laid into a grave, but that grave will never have ultimate victory over us. This passage is to show and to prove and to demonstrate that we have the hope of eternal life. The fear of death was strong in the Greek and the Roman culture because their religious systems offered no hope for any certainty in the afterlife. All they had was some vague concept of when they physically died that their soul would travel to some, uh, some ethereal place called the place of the dead, Hades. That's how the Greeks and the Romans thought about death. They didn't know anything about eternity and what it would be like. And so that left the Greek and Roman pagans of Paul's time with tremendous anxiety. They had no answers. What happens when this life is over? But with the message that Christianity brought of victory over death, as demonstrated by Christ's own resurrection, his own victory over the grave, suddenly this culture that had no hope, that had, that had nothing but fear, suddenly had hope. They suddenly had, uh, had, had something that they could look forward to, and now they knew what was going to happen. And that's why Christianity was so, so, grew so rapid within the Roman Empire, because now there was a hope that was being offered to this, this people that otherwise had no hope. Paul then goes on in verse 29, starting in verse 29, he mentions two things 
that would be pointless behavior if there had been no resurrection. Now, these statements have caused commentators for literally millennia to try to figure out what the meaning of, of these verses are, and, and still nobody knows for sure. Here in 1529, otherwise, why will they who are baptized for the dead, why, what will they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? So this first question that commentators and students of the scriptures have, have had to deal with is, what is this baptism for the dead? If you're all hoping that I'm going to tell you, you're going to be disappointed. Because I don't know myself, to be honest. So what in the world is Paul talking about when he brings up this mysterious topic? There is really nothing anywhere else in Scripture to give us any serious clue. There's a lot of speculation, and you can go and look at commentaries online and, and find all the different ideas that people have as to what it is. And maybe you've already answered this yourself, and if you are, congratulations. You've done better than me. But, um, but we really don't know what he's talking to, talking about. We must assume, however, that it had some meaning to the Corinthians, and that it had something to do with life that extends beyond physical death, because that's the context, that's the point of all of this. So whatever they may have been doing, it would have served no purpose. This is what the point he's trying to make. It would serve no purpose if our existence ends after our time on earth is over. So I think the problem with this verse is too many people have spent too much time trying to figure out what this obscure practice is referring to, and they've not spent enough time appreciating the actual point that Paul is trying to make. That whatever they were doing, it has something to do with those that are dead, and it would be a pointless activity if there were no resurrection. Now, the second example that Paul uses has probably not been nearly as hotly debated as the question of the resurrection from the dead, but it still has caused some confusion. This is the reference to him fighting wild beasts in Ephesus. Now, there is no record in the book of Acts that, uh, that Paul ever faced beasts. It was a practice. We know that the Romans did that. They threw people to the, to the wild lions and to the animals, but we have no record of it in, uh, in, in the scripture. Some have suggested that Paul is using this phrase figuratively about the struggles that he faced with, with certain individuals in Ephesus, the resistance that he got from preaching the gospel. Again, we don't know. Either way, the point that Paul is making here is that he is asking what would be the reason for putting himself in danger or making any kind of sacrifice whatsoever if this life is all there is. And thus, he summarizes the argument by saying, if there is no resurrection, we should just simply live for the moment and just get as much pleasure as we can fit in one day. Eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And that, that's certainly a philosophy that has been adopted by much of our modern culture. And why shouldn't it be? If, no, if there is no eternal perspective why would we choose not to live that way? Why not just take advantage and, and enjoy life and get all the pleasure and everything that we can out of it right now? If the dead do not rise, if there is nothing beyond this life, then we might as well just eat and drink and enjoy it because tomorrow we're going to die and that's the end of it. However, Paul makes it very clear that there is much more to live for than just the moment. We have the hope of eternity with Christ, a hope of eternity in perfect righteousness. And we begin that experience of living in peace with God immediately once we have experienced salvation. That eternity is not something we're waiting for, we begin eternity the moment we place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. That's the beginning of a never-ending relationship with God. And we live every day in light of eternity, in light of not this world here, but what we are waiting for to be with God, to, to receive the rewards of service here for eternity, for, for, everlast, for, for, for ever and everlasting. 
Now, Paul goes on actually in verse 33. And I, yeah, I have it right here. And this is kind of an unrelated side note that I'm going to add here. He makes an interesting statement here in verse 33, in which he says that bad company corrupts good character. This is actually a quote from an ancient Greek play. And it says a number of things about Paul and his appreciation for culture. First, we know that Paul, although he was a very devout Jew, he was very well versed in the writings of the Romans and the Greeks. He knew the, knew the literature art of, of the Greek and the Roman culture. And this is not the only place in which he quotes from pagan authors. In Acts 17, he tells the audience in Athens, if he's there on Mars Hill and he's, he's addressing the people in Athens, he says, we are his offspring. He quotes there from another Greek author. He also quotes the poet Apinides in, in the letter to Titus when he says that the Cretans, they are people who are liars and brutes and lazy gluttons. And that, was a, that was actually a quote from, from a Greek author as well. What this shows is that Paul placed value in knowing and understanding culture and literature. He recognized that even people can discern some truth through observation and reason. And such an attitude, it can create a conflict in our mind as Bible-believing Christians because much of popular culture does go against biblical principles. Be wise and discerning as we consume the, the literature and the culture, the, the movies and the, the television shows and, and all the things, the, 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 the novel, whatever it is, as we consume, we have to be discerning in, in looking at what have they been able to glean that is true and what, based on a biblical uh, perspective, what do we discard? What do we throw out? So it's an important message for us to evaluate the message which the world sends us through culture and interpret it in the light of revealed truth. Paul then ends this section with a plea for the believers to stop sinning and live life with eternity in mind. We need to understand that we are not called to live for today only or even to live for the day we're going to retire, to be frugal and, and careful and so someday we can retire comfortably. That's not what, what Paul is calling us for. He is telling us that we need to live in light of, of eternity. We are called to act and behave as if we are going to live forever in the presence of God. And by that setting an example, and by setting that example, we hope and pray that we can bring others to faith in the Lord. The next section of the passage responds directly to the kinds of questions that we ask about what our bodies will be like when we are resurrected. These verses provide the most detailed description anywhere in the Bible of what our bodies will be like when we are with the Lord in eternity. The purpose of the various illustrations is to show that the bodies that we will have at the resurrection are not the same as our current natural bodies. Paul uses several examples here. He, he talks about different types of animals. Uh, he talks about the way a plant has to die in the ground first for, as a seed before it emerges from the ground as, as a plant. He talks about the differences between the star, stars and the moon and the sun. The basic point here is not to give a science lesson, but simply to use these well-known examples to show how dramatically different one thing can be from the other. Now, the explicit teaching that Paul is making here is found in verses 42 through 45. So it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first Adam became a living, be living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. When Paul says that our resurrection body will be incorruptible and raised in glory, it is a simple statement that pain, disease, deformity, 
age and destruction will no longer be a part of our existence. The body will be a literal body. We know this from Philippians 3.21, that our resurrection body will be like that of the Lord's, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Paul makes it clear that ordinary flesh and blood cannot be in the eternal presence of God. Just as our souls and our spirits must be transformed to be worthy to be in God's presence, so our physical bodies must be changed into a perfect substance, something of a spiritual nature that cannot decay. Now, in verse 51, he begins talking about the resurrection in terms that are exclusive to the revelation that has been given to him. He starts by introducing what, he's, what he is about to say is a mystery. When Paul uses that word mystery, almost exclusively he is talking about unrevealed, previously unrevealed truth that had been given to him. He uses it a number of times in the scripture. It is an unrevealed secret that, that has only been given to him, not to the other writers in scripture. He describes the event which will bring to an end this dispensation of grace in which Jesus Christ will appear in the clouds and call home the members of the body of Christ. Now there's a parallel to this that we find in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 through 18. And the verse that's up there is actually from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I want us to look at these two passages. I have them here lined up side by side. We're going to compare each one with the various points that Paul is making through here. First of all, in 1 Corinthians, he says it's a mystery. In 1 Thessalonians, he says that he received this by the word of the Lord. So he's, he's identifying the fact that both of these are direct revelations which he had received from God. He wasn't going back and reinterpreting the Old Testament or the Gospels, but that he is, in fact, this is new information which he received. And then he goes on to say in 1 Corinthians, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And then in 1 Thessalonians, he says basically the same thing with different words, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will, not by, will by no means precede those who are asleep. That there will be, of course, falling asleep or being asleep is a euphemism for physical death. Uh, so he's saying that not all are going to die but all are going to be changed. And he's again giving hope. There will be those who will be alive and they will not precede those who have fallen asleep or who are dead. And then we, hear, we see here how it's going to take place. It's going to be announced at the last trumpet for the trumpet will sound. Again in 1 Thessalonians, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And then, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. First Thessalonians, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. And then here we see the eternal nature. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. He's talking about eternity there. And then he concludes the first Thessalonian passage by saying, and thus we shall be with the Lord forever. So by putting these two accounts together, we find that the moment will be instantaneous at an unannounced and unpredictable time. The dead will be resurrected and the living will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, a moment that is shorter than we can measure. Our bodies will not be subject to decay or corruption ever again. We will be taken to the heavenly places to be forever with the Lord. This event is, of course, different than any of the other resurrections that are mentioned in the Bible. Though there are similarities in the nature of the resurrection bodies, the timing and the place in which resurrected saints end up are all different. These are different events than what we read in the Old Testament in Daniel, when we read about it in Job, when we read about resurrection in Revelation, when we read about it in the Gospels. Different event that he is talking, uh, that he is referring to here. This event 
as it says in verse 51, is a mystery. It is never mentioned in the scriptures outside of the writings of Paul. Uh, there is also a reference in Titus 2.13, where it is called the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think of those words, Titus 2.13. The blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We long and we yearn for that moment in which we will be removed from the pain and the suffering of this life, and we will be as we were meant to be, in perfect fellowship with God our Maker. In 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 4, 8, Paul also speaks of there being a crown of righteousness laid up waiting for all those who love the Lord's appearing. We should be people who love the Lord's appearing. We should be longing for that day. We want to be caught up. We want to be changed in the twinkling of an eye so that we can be with the Lord forever. Paul then ends this discussion by reiterating that it is through the resurrection that God will conquer all the enemies of our soul, death and sin. The victory is ours through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have a victorious hope. We will forever be removed from the pain and the suffering that comes with the curse of sin. It will be cast away, never to be brought back into God's perfect creation. That is what we wait for. That's what we long for. That's what we are loving. We love the thought of his appearing. We anticipate what, what is going to happen when that becomes reality. In the many years that I've been in the ministry, there's probably no other passage in which the way I have read and studied it has changed so dramatically than this passage here at 1 Corinthians 15. When I was a young man, boy, I needed to know all the answers. I had to dig through it. I had to figure out what he was talking about. What in the world is this baptism for the dead? What's he talking about? It was, I saw this passage as a doctrinal challenge to try to parse each verse, verse and give them a satisfactory explanation. Where does it fit into the end time scenario? What are our resurrection bodies going to be like? What is the baptism for the dead? All of these questions had to be answered. Now, as I've gotten older, and I have, I can guarantee you that, in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 has become much less of a doctrinal puzzle to me and much more of a passage of hope and comfort. It is assurance of the certainty of the resurrection and the fact that we will be with our Lord and Savior in eternity. And as I grow more weary of this world and the reality for me personally of eternity becomes closer and closer, reading about having an uncorruptible body has become increasingly more meaningful. Knowing that death will be swallowed up in victory gives me great comfort. Looking forward to the blast of the last trumpet gives me this great sense of anticipation as I realize that it could happen at any moment. All the burdens and the cares that we carry in this world will be taken away. We will have bodies free of suffering, pain, worry, temptation, and sin. Rather, we will be forever enveloped in the glory and the love of the great God and Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ. The chapter closes in verse 58 with the verse that you see on the screen. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This chapter closes with words of encouragement to remind us that we should not be moved from our commitment and dedication to the Lord whom we serve. We are encouraged to keep the truth of the resurrection at the forefront of our minds 
and that we should throw ourselves fully into God's service. Our work, as the promise here says, is not in vain, and we will be rewarded for all that we do in the power of the Holy Spirit. There has been no time in my ministry, over 35 years now, when these words have been more encouraging. And I've had to rely upon them many times, I'll tell you. Discouragement has, has been a, a close companion to me in 35 years. But with all that has happened in our world since March, all that's happened around us and even things that have happened in our own congregation, I have asked myself many times if what I am doing for the Lord is not just a waste of time. Is this even worth it? What am I doing? Maybe, I, maybe everybody would be better off if I were not even involved in all of this. I've asked that question literally many times. When we face discouragement in serving God, we should look to this reminder that God does see what we are doing for him. That our labor in the Lord, the things that we do, the fact that we press on despite the discouragement, discouragement despite the difficulties, we will be rewarded. Our labor is not in vain. There's value in it. We may not see it now, but we know that the promise will be, will be fulfilled. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 ultimately is one of hope. It is a stark reminder that this world is not all that there is. That there is a great and a wonderful eternity which awaits for us. If there's anything we gather from this passage as we study it, there's so much truth. We can learn about our, our eternal bodies, our resurrection bodies. We can get the end time scenario. We learn about being transformed and changed in the twinkling of an eye. We learn about the importance of the resurrection and why it was necessary for Christ to rise from the dead. We see the actual gospel given in, in the most succinct form in the first four verses. There is so much that is contained in this passage, in this chapter. But ultimately, what this gives us is a hope, a hope for eternity. Let's not get lost in the doctrine and forget the message. The message is eternity. The message is we will be with Christ. The message is these lowly bodies will be transformed like his great heavenly body, like his spiritual body, like, like who Jesus Christ was when he was resurrected. That substance that is fit for eternity. I can't tell you exactly what it is. We know that it's going to be something you can touch. We know that it will be very, very real. But the exact nature of it is still still a mystery to us is still uncertain but it is going to happen and i want us to come to to come to the conclusion of our study of first corinthians 15 not just with with more information about what our resurrection bodies will be like or about the end times i want us to come away from this with the certainty that christ is now risen and we have the hope of eternity and nothing is going to change that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this powerful passage of Scripture that teaches us so much, but teaches us with the, with the purpose of reminding us that we are eternal beings and that we are living already in eternity and that we need to look forward to that, to being forever in your presence. And then being reminded that the things that we do for you are not useless. They are not in vain. They are not something that, 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 is, that, that is a waste of time. But Lord, we are investing in eternal things when we serve you. And now may the love of God and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the peace and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. And you're dismissed.